Hello and welcome to Movies About Music, mm-hmm. a podcast about movies about music. In today's episode, we are discussing the film Sound of Metal. Yes. Which came out in 2020, mm-hmm. which for us is last year. Right. This is a movie that I I saw the trailer for, mm-hmm. and I immediately said, I have to see this movie. And I think I may have sent you the... Yeah. The, I remember uh, exactly what you said. What did I say? You said you were going to wait to see to watch this movie because you might need me to hold your hand through it. That's exactly mm-hmm. right. I remember now. And I knew just from the trailer that um, this was going to be hard for me to watch because I am a drummer. And I went through a, a scare right, uh, regarding the subject matter of this film. Mm-hmm. So I was once working on some sound design, working on some waveforms. Mm-hmm. And it was a very pitched kind of sine wave kind of waveform that I was really editing and really editing and really editing. Mm-hmm. So what happens is if you get a specific pitch of a waveform and you repeat it over and over and over at high volumes, Mm -hmm. it's going to damage your hearing. Right. And I didn't know this, but after a couple hours of working on this, I put it away and that night I lay down in bed and then all of a sudden my hearing Mm -hmm. became, it felt like someone was shoving cotton in my ear holes. Mm -hmm. And then the ringing started. Oh, right. Just like in the movie we just saw. Exactly. So we should maybe back up a little bit. Do you want to give us a little plot summary of what's going on in right. this film? So are we doing spoilers a little bit? I, th- I think, I like think we, we have, have to. to. Yeah. yeah. So if you haven't seen this movie, uh, you might want to come back and listen right. later. Right. Because um, we're going to have to address the general plot of the movie and um, go into some details of what happens to the protagonist. Um, his name is Ruben. And he seems to be a heavy metal drummer, right? He's in a band with his girlfriend. It seems to be like a uh, White Stripes kind of, uh, but punk and more metal okay, band, yeah. wouldn't you say? I don't know, because I don't listen to this music at all. I don't either. I don't, it's, it's sort of like an experimental mm-hmm. um, drums. And then she, his mm-hmm. girlfriend, mm-hmm. Lou, she plays guitar and sings. Do you, would you call it singing? Why not? <laughs> I, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, she does kind of a Mm -hmm. screamy thing. Mm -hmm. So they're on tour. They seem to be on the verge of like the type of success that a lot of musicians would consider um, success, like indie musicians, meaning like you have enough of a following to tour, right? And that's for me, that's major. And I know the kind of pressure that goes into that stage of a band. Usually it ends there. A lot of bands, you know, that's as far as they will go. And so they're kind of at that cusp of, you know, are we going to do this or is this going to happen or not? And they live in an RV. They're living that tour van life. And it's just the two of them. Suddenly his ears start ringing. As I was kind of describing. Because mm-hmm. you hear what he's hearing throughout the movie. So it's told from his perspective, but not like first person necessarily, but it's like... Well, in a kind of film theory sense, we tend to call this subjective versus objective. Yeah. Um, you can call it point of view also, mm-hmm. except that sound theory really Um, resists that because... I see, yeah. So they call it point of audition sound. Okay. Which is a bit too geeky and technical for me. I just tend to think of things in terms of objective sound and subjective Mm -hmm. sound. And it keeps switching back and forth throughout the movie. Right. And so you hear what he's hearing through different parts of the movie. And he, it sounds like he's, like he's underwater or something at certain points. Right. And then certain points um, you hear the cotton smashed into your ear. It progresses very fast. His hearing is de- deteriorating at a rapid speed. And then he, at one point he goes to the pharmacy and the pharmacist tells him that he needs to see a doctor immediately. And, the, and he goes to see the doctor who says, your hearing is at maybe like a 25% capacity right? and you need to eliminate all this exposure to, to loud noise immediately or else you're going to hear, you're going to lose it entirely you're going to lose your hearing entirely right and then cut to him doing a gig a heavy metal gig like immediately that night and the doctor tells him that there's a surgery where you know he can get an implant a cochlear implant is it i guess yeah 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 implant but it's very costly 
$40,000 to $80,000, he says. And the thing is, this is where I was like, oh man, he hears what he wants to hear. Only what he doesn't hear the part where he needs to eliminate his exposure to loud noises. All he hears is, oh, I can fix this, which is how so many men think. <laughs> totally, totally. I was men, the same yeah, because I that was when I was sort of reminded of you and a lot of you know, musicians I know, it's like, oh, okay, I can fix this. All I need is mm-hmm. money. So yeah, he, he goes to this gig because he has to, this is like, you know, he can't cancel this tour. And then he has to run out of the gig because he can't hear anymore at all. So he right. loses his hearing in a span of like a few hours. So just to sort of mm-hmm. um, draw back a little bit, the thing that was interesting in this buildup is he's like, denial, mm-hmm. I got to fix this. I can fix this. But the other thing is, he can't tell her because they've built the thing that you were describing before. So they've built this world together. Right. And then he knows at the moment that he has to tell her, Mm -hmm. it's going to come crumbling down. Mm -hmm. But he ends up going to this Vermont looking like farm. Like it's a very green place where there's a big house and an old man with a dog. And uh, it turns out that it's a house for deaf people. Yeah, so he goes to this, like, deaf camp. Right. But just to go back to the the loss of hearing thing, mm-hmm. obviously this is over a long period of time. You know, mm-hmm. this is something musicians have to deal with all the time, is the idea of hearing loss when you gig a lot and you play on stage mm-hmm. a lot. For me, I, I didn't have this kind of situation. I had, what happens sometimes with the hearing loss is what I learned is, you know, there's these hairs mm-hmm. um, and then there are frequencies. So there are, uh, there's different frequency hairs, I guess. Mm-hmm. I don't know the technical terms for this. But what happens is one shuts down and then it never pops up again. Okay. Something like that. Okay. That's what the ringing is. So it's this pitch that stays that way. And then for me, it lasted for three fucking days. Oh my gosh. And Did you see a doctor? I didn't see a doctor. Okay. Um, I don't think I had insurance at the time. Yikes. Um, yeah. But I just waited. I was crying myself to sleep at night. Mm-hmm. And the scene that really got to me, before they go to the deaf camp, mm-hmm. he throws a fit. Mm-hmm. Remember that? Mm-hmm. And I kind of poked you or I mm-hmm. said something. And that's what I felt like. I wanted to destroy shit. Mm. because it was in my head and mm-hmm. I couldn't get out I couldn't get away from it mm-hmm. and I thought this is the end mm-hmm. I thought if if my hearing goes this is it mm-hmm. so we should mention another thing that goes into this is there's this always underlying concept which is going to come back at the end mm-hmm. of his former heroin addiction yes i think that's a very important part of the movie and i think this deaf camp place facility was also an addict you're right. Right? Yeah, yeah that's yeah. what it sounded like. Maybe not for everyone, or maybe right. it was. We never, we never I think for the adults, that. they had all right. been, I don't know, there were other addicts, you know, former addicts, obviously. Right. I don't know. Once you're an addict, are you always an addict? I think that's the okay, idea. Yeah. So that's at least um, in the Alcoholics Anonymous. Sense. Okay, yeah. So, this, so it might go to all kinds of addicts. Yeah, so Ruben was, had been sober for four years, and... Uh, This old man who runs this deaf camp, uh, he said that he was an alcoholic, right? Yeah, and so the the addict thing, the recognition was really important, I think, in their relationship, in their dynamic. And how he interacts with um, the other campers, I think. Right. Yeah. So it's it's this kind of strange thing about um, not strange, I guess, but it's there's this underlying theme of denial Mm -hmm. on the part of him. Mm Um, and then there's this underlying theme of acceptance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So um, that's his kind of character conflict, I mm-hmm. think. Mm-hmm. And then she has to integrate herself. His girlfriend, Lou, mm-hmm. has to integrate herself into that reality. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things with this camp is you have to be all in mm-hmm. or you can't be here. Right. And she makes the decision for him. Mm-hmm. So she says, you got to do this. Mm-hmm. I'm bailing. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it was a very kind of sad scene. It was very sad. Yeah. Yeah. So she leaves, and then he's brought into this community. Right. And I thought it was really um, brilliantly done. Again, you're doing these shifts between objective and subjective mm-hmm. sound, so we get into his condition. The sign language is not translated, or sorry, is not subtitled mm-hmm. at first. Mm-mm. Eventually, he learns sign language, and then that 
become subtitled right. because we can't know. Mm -hmm. So we're sort of identifying with his character mm -hmm. all the way through, and we have to see how he's going to come to this level of denial and acceptance, which is, to me, thematic of addiction mm -hmm. and issues like that. But there's another thing. Whenever I watch a film, I try to turn my analytical brain off, and mm -hmm. I just try to take the film at the level of experience. Right. And um, so I don't want to know too much information about a movie before I see it. Um, these themes crop in, and one of the themes is just the idea of community. Oh, yeah. I, that, I was thinking about that. And being yeah. an expat, actually. Oh, yeah. I was thinking about that, too. So, you're, you're mm -hmm. in this world the yeah. whole time, and then you have to get into this other world, mm -hmm. and it's a world where you don't know the language. You don't feel mm -hmm. at home. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Did that resonate with you at all? I, it did. Um, I did this weird expat life thing during my 20s. I mean, I, I never wanted to settle down, you know, as a child, I knew I was going to be like all over the place. Because um, that was decided for me when I, you know, my parents moved me to the United States when I was three. And then um, we came back to Korea. And then, you know, we went back to the United States. And then we lived in Japan for a little bit. So that's always been my life. Like I went to, I lived in Barcelona, I lived in Boston. Um, and then I lived in Paris for like a whopping eight years. Then I ended up coming back home and, you know, I'm still pretty young, but I really crave community now. And you were kind of living that life most of your yeah, adult life yeah, too, right? Right. Yeah. That being part of a community is, like if you're an expat, being part of a community is a hugely important thing. Right. He had, he and her had this kind mm -hmm. of, you know, like a marriage, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And then he's pushed into this community. Mm -hmm. And then he has to kind of find his way right. in there. Like what right. you have to do, like I'm sure you had to do in Paris. Right. And like I had to do when I first came to Korea or anywhere I've gone to. Mm -hmm. This is really hard for a lot of expats, right? Mm -hmm. But this is just something I thought about as I was as I was watching. Um, the thing is that he there's there's also a religious undertone. It's sometimes explicit. Mm -hmm. Like there's a religious aspect. And he mentions, you know, at one point that this is... I don't know if it was funded by a religious. Yeah, group or yeah, something. no, it was it, the church runs it basically, gives money to this facility. Right, but then that becomes an element of as well. Really, um, I didn't catch that. He can't let his other world go. Mm -hmm. Like, as to be an expat, you have to live in the in, mm -hmm. in the community you've chosen mm -hmm. and let kind of let yourself go. But he's always he can't let go of his former existence. Right. So there, you've got the addict thing as well. Mm -hmm. He sneaks out of the place. Mm -hmm gets the surgery done, and then he has to come back and tell the guy who runs the community. Mm -hmm, right. And the guy says, you're talking like an addict now. Mm -hmm. No, Remember you that? sound and look like an addict mm, right now. Yeah, yeah, I don't know what, you, what put you in this situation, but you sound and look like an addict. Because Ruben is played by Riz Ahmed, who has huge eyes. <laughs> the owl, he calls yeah. him the owl. He has these huge, like... I'm sorry, but like cokehead eyes. I think he's very attractive, <laughs> but he does have cokehead. Like he has like a very frenzied Intense. look about him, right? Perfect casting. Yeah, for, perfect. For he has a frenzied look about him naturally. I mean, he looks like that in other roles too. And he says, I just need to get them. I can get the money back, but I just need some money. So, Well, like you were yeah. saying, it's still like, I can fix this. Yeah, exactly. So his whole time yeah. he's been doing this, I can fix yeah. this thing. He sounds like a gambling addict. And he sounds like a drug, drug addict, right? Right, Because right. that's the mentality of addicts. If only I can get this one fix, I can fix everything. Because I just right. need this one fix, and then I can go back and fix Just this one time. I just need this just this one time so that I can go fix everything, and then I'll stop. That is what goes on in the addict's brain, I think. Right. But so the religious thing, um, mm -hmm. the owner of this place is the old man, like you were saying. Mm -hmm. he, he had lost his hearing in the Vietnam War, and he started this community. He has a mission for him to do while he's there. This is before he gets the surgery. And he says, I want you to sit in a room every morning with a pen and some paper and just write and sit quietly, you know, and during the times when you can't be alone with your thoughts anymore, write something down, something mm -hmm. like that, right? Yeah, and then you, the, the really important part of this whole thing, this assignment, is I want you to write whatever it is. I want you to keep on writing until you can sit still. That was it. Mm -hmm. He says, something will open up for you. In a, in, a, in a religious sense. He, he says it in a religious sense. And you'll find this moment of peace in yourself. Right. I didn't take it as a religious 
mm. sense. In, I thought it was yeah. pretty explicit. I think he, I oh, thought he mentioned God, I, right. in fact, I think. Yeah. I could be wrong, but I could be remembering I wrong. didn't get that vibe. Okay. I, I, there was no religious vibe that I got from whatever he said. Oh, I got it very strongly. Oh. Okay. But so, again, this is the idea of this community. There's almost a church-like, mm-hmm. for me anyway, in my viewing of it, there's this church-like element to it that mm-hmm. you have to give yourself over to. Mm-hmm. And he can't do it. Mm-hmm. Right? right. So by getting the surgery, he has taken himself out. Mm-hmm. You know, the guy offers him a future to stay there because mm-hmm. people like him, mm-hmm. but he can't get this fix right. in more ways than one out mm-hmm. of his out of his mind. What do you think that is about the 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 old guy? What do you think he was talking about? Why do you think he needed to surrender to this community? What do you think he needed to surrender? Well, there's there's the theme um, that's running where he has to he has to remember somebody writes on the board. Uh, mm-hmm. You have to learn how to be deaf. That's it. You have to learn how to be deaf, mm-hmm. and he never does that. Right. And we think he's getting that. You know, movies do this brilliantly mm-hmm. all the time. You know, like this was kind of Jamie Lannister's kind of arc, right? Mm-hmm. In Game of Thrones, where he, you know, he needs to learn how to become a human being, but then at the end he falls off. Mm-hmm. Similar thing, kind of. Here, he needed to learn to accept his deafness, and he made the steps, Mm -hmm. but then he never did. Mm -hmm. He couldn't couldn't do the acceptance part. So, he's still stuck on his his life, Mm -hmm. his previous life, and getting back to his previous life. So, um, the religious element to me is that this is a community, this is a people um, who have found a sense of peace with their deafness. Yes. And that becomes their identity, I guess. Yes. Their their shared again, sort of you have to think of it almost as an expat experience that you have to give yourself over to rather than, you know, see it as oppositional to right. your life in your home country or whatever. Right. So I'm sort of teasing out these themes. But to me there was a religious kind of church like element to it in a very positive way. Right. For me it was just I, I thought that this community was not it didn't strike me as cultish or anything. Not at all. Right. It seemed like a very healthy community that he needed to be part of to in his journey towards acceptance, right? And that he could he found a place in this community where he can um, actually contribute something. He was very good with the kids, right? There's a certain theme of how drumming is not just an auditory um, uh, experience, it's also like a sensory experience, like independent of auditory Totally. Right? It's a body thing. Right. So that was kind of explored in the middle. And he recognizes this and he kind of, you know, he shares this with the kids and, you know, with the vibrations. And there's also something very primal about the act of just beating the drums with the sticks, right? Independent yeah. of music, right? True. Yeah. And that was explored. And I thought that was, I, I always thought that about drumming. Drummers are different from other musicians. It's true. I've dated a lot of them. And that's why. <laughs> And now one I'm married of a to one. Line of many. <laughs> yeah. Just um, kidding. No, but I mean, not many, but you right. know, I've, I've dated. I'm if joking. I, if I dated a musician, it was probably a drummer. I think you made that clear when we first yeah, started yeah. dating. Um, and I don't know. I think that they are different from other instrumentalists because I think you guys are just driven by different things. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the, the aspects, there's something, there's a purity to what drives a drummer to me i mean i'm not saying that other instrumentalists are not pure but there's a purity and there's a primal energy about like drummers that i really like and i i I identify with it because i think singers are very similar there's it's it's a very primal act you know in the very beginning there was us right Mm -hmm. right (laughs) percussion there was percussion and and voice Mm -hmm. and um i was thinking could you still be a drummer a percussionist? No, I think no? I think the thing with the movie is, I mean, actually, there's a, there's a woman named Evelyn Glennie. There's a documentary called Touch the Sound. Okay, and she's a drummer and she's deaf, mm-hmm. so you can, but um, I don't think he will. I, yeah, you know, I don't think he will either. So the end of the movie, right. it, again, spoiler, sorry, but he's sitting on this bench, and we think it might be Paris. I think it looks like 
Nuit sur Seine, which is um, a very rich suburb. I love Paris. it when you speak French. <laughs> But anyway, th the reason I didn't recognize it at first is because I've never, I never have occasion to go there because it's like this rich, not gated community, but like practically gated. Right. It's like no Paris pleb will ever need to go there. But I think I went there once for a dinner, like I, I played there in a band for a private dinner party. At first, we were so confused because it was never explicitly told. So at first I was like, is this Montreal? Because people st suddenly were speaking French, right? But then later when he was sitting in the park or the bench or whatever that was, it looked like Nuit sur Seine. I don't know mm -hmm. like if, if you guys recognize it. Right. So I, I don't want to give away the ending. I, I don't want to go that far. But right. So there he has the moment that the guy was talking about. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then the stillness. movie ends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he has his moment of stillness and and quietude. Right. And to me, I, to me, that is a religious moment for him. Okay. And I think it's interesting that there's church bells. Yeah, yeah. What happens in that whole mm -hmm. bougie, um, yeah. upper bougie right. um, scene that's going mm -hmm. on? So he goes back and he sees Lou again, mm -hmm. and it's just like, and she's become bougie. She's no longer a, a punk girl. She's mm. made up with her father, and she's mm -hmm. um, back in this in this world. And he re realizes this is not my world anymore. Mm. And that's the crushing moment between the two of them, and it's quite sad. It's heartbreaking because I've been Lou in so many, you know. I was going to ask yeah. you about Lou's character. I was wondering yeah. if it, because from you know for me like the character I could right. totally identify with Ruben. Right. Um, I was going to ask you. What kind of things in Lou's character mm -hmm. sort of resonated with you? Well, I've been in love with, you know, a couple of Rubens in my life, you know? Mm -hmm. Meaning, there's something so tragic about being young. Like, you will never really feel that strongly about another person. Like, you know, that purity of, you know, just being in, in each other's world, like just the two of you. I mean, we have that yeah. in our old age, but, you know, usually... It doesn't happen after a certain age. Because, you you know, you, you kind of... Yeah, it's hard to be delusional like that. You know, it's hard to be hopeful. And, you know, it's hard to just ignore all the stuff that, life's put, that life puts in the way. But when you're young, you have possibilities, potential. But also there's something so tragic about potential because it's, it's uncertainty. Right. And that can be very confusing and conflicting. And so I understood her character arc so well. Like, you know, she wants to, she does, she can't help him. She doesn't have her own money. She has to go be a good daughter to her daddy in order to survive, you know, just keep doing what she's doing. She doesn't know, like this, this girl probably hasn't worked a waitressing job. Exactly. Like, you know, like it, it's so hard. It's so daunting. But she, what she knows is that she loves Ruben. And right. so she does the one thing that she knows how to do, which is leave him. Right. That was, it, it was early in the movie too. Right. And it was kind of like the transition, I guess, from act one to act two, if you want to think of it that right. way, where that's the, ch that's the, that's the incident that pushes mm -hmm. him forward on his journey. That was tragic. And then we get mm -hmm. back to when he sees her again mm -hmm. and everything's changed and she's not a flat character. She's gone mm -hmm. through a change, yeah. right? I think I asked you while we were watching the movie, is she going to learn sign language? Well, she didn't. Mm -hmm. And it turned out it, that's not the way the arc went, right? Uh -uh. Yeah. Because he was still fixated on right. fixing things. But she was completely changed, Right. In a way that he wasn't. Yeah, she was never that person, you know? Yeah, so that's an interesting way of looking it's, at it. So which like, is the genuine Lou? It, that's, that's hard, because I think I, I changed in, the, in a very similar way. <laughs> you know, I was like a free-spirited, like, you know, I was never a punk rocker, but, you know, I was... Like, I could sleep in an RV for months, you know. I never did it, but, you know. But now it's, like, completely unthinkable, because I need to know that I'm going to be okay and that, you know, but then ironically, if let's say you were in this, his position, I would be able to help you because I've made I those thought about this. Yeah, yeah, I would totally be. I have, you know, I have insurance up my ass. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> right. Um, I also, you know, I sold, I'm a total sellout. I have, you know, I have security, I have money. I'm a grown woman. I don't have to ask my dad for anything, but she doesn't have that. And in order for her to have any of those things, 
she needs to change. Yeah, and so she sort of she adopts that world. She uh-huh. makes up with her father. I oh, mean, yeah. she's got her her mom killed herself and stuff right, like that. Right. She's got her hardships. The thing that you're kind of teasing out is something that I was thinking about and didn't really couldn't really resolve in my own mind is um, how are we supposed to feel about her? Because the arc of the movie is his journey. I just thought I thought she was an interesting character because she she definitely changed. Why don't we take a break and we'll come right back with movies about music. And we're back. So I wanted to talk about some of the themes that are going on in this film. Yes. And one of the things that I kind of felt coming out of this film is it had a a tragic feel to it in an almost Greek sense, in an an ancient Greek storytelling Mm, sense, mm -hmm. which is, you know, with Greek tragedy, it's always that the protagonist undermines himself, and it Mm. usually has something to do with family. Mm. So she's his family, right? We he he doesn't have any family. Mm. So in his case, first it's a, it's a completely tragic line of the protagonist character all the way through. So she is a right. rich character, I think, mm. but it's his right down to the sound. And so I think some of these spiritual elements that I was picking up really resonated with me very strongly in a very positive sense. In in the sense of finding that space of spirituality in whatever way you want to conceive it Mm -hmm. and kind of living in it. I mean, this is something that filmmakers like Terrence Malick do, is is Mm. come to this point of reverie Mm. where you can kind of live in this very religious, Mm. if you want to think of it that way, or spiritual, if you want to think of it that way, moment where you're able to kind of pull everything or drag everything away and kind of come to this moment. But before you can get there... Mm -hmm. And this is also kind of like a Dante's Divine Comedy kind Mm. of thing, is you have to fucking go through hell. And the hell that he goes through Mm -hmm. is completely audible. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you picked up on this too. And there was a couple of times when you and I were both kind of, you know, pushing on our earlobes or or whatever you call that thing that covers the ear hole. (laughs) Right? Yeah. Because the sound was so harsh. The sound design was so... Do you know the name for that? No, I don't. But he really does go through an audible hell. So he's been going, he's been driving for this, like, and again, the hero, the hero trying to overcome this, trying to make right Uh his tragic experience. And then he's going to put himself through hell. Mm -hmm. It's his decision Mm -hmm. that puts him in the hell that Mm -hmm. he experiences. And the hell is entirely audible. Mm -hmm. The sound design is fucking brilliant. I don't think it's very difficult to pull off, but it's still from a storytelling element. Mm -hmm. I felt that very much so. Because for me, Walking around in a city, and part of the th- reason why I don't like urban environments is because of the noise mm, and, yeah. and the chaos and the fact that you have to hear everything. Oh, yeah. I, it's much better for me in a place like, and this might be why I'm a constant expat. One reason is that I don't have to understand everything happening around me. Yeah. Like, I don't live the language. If right. I'm in the United States and I'm walking through, you know, Los Angeles or, or whatever, I have to hear everything and mm-hmm. everything makes sense to me. And it's, for me, it's anxiety inducing, all of that noise. So, he emerges out of that, out of finally getting his wish. Mm-hmm. And then it's hell. Right. Uh, we have to clarify why it's hell. It's because the hearing doesn't come back as you would, you know, as he yeah, expected as he it. Expected. He's been he's been aiming for this right. solution, right. and he gets it right. And it's like a very high frequency. It's like almost like you, the phone is breaking up. It was a really high frequency. Um, I mean, he had a choice of the super tinny high frequency or mm-hmm. the more or the less clear kind of broken fragmented, right. but more manageable. And he chooses the second one, I think. Right, right. But then as he's going through life, it's just... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a brilliant. Yeah. But it's not, you know, it's like yeah. the car going yeah, by. Yeah. And it's the child playing in the park. Yeah, and it's it, completely... These beautiful unbearable. things yeah. become hellish. Yeah. And I immediately, when I heard that, I was like, I couldn't live with that. No, that yeah. that's when I was like, okay, this is fucking hell. Mm-hmm. And he gave it to himself. Mm-hmm. Like, that's the great tragic, that's the great Greek tragic thing. Yeah, it, it always happens in in stories. Like, the little mermaid got her legs, you know, for three days. Right. But the sea witch 
I think, fail to mention. The, the first thing she, she mentions is that, okay, you're going to have your legs and you have three days to make the prince fall in love with you. And the Little Mermaid's like, cool, he's already fallen in love with me. Okay. And then she's like, but you have to give me your voice. Your voice is on loan for mm. three days. And so without her voice, she can't prove that she's the one who saved the prince. Mm. So it becomes more challenging, right? But it, this happens in real life too with a lot of plastic surgery and like all these surgeries. Exactly. That, yeah. They don't tell you the details. And it becomes your living nightmare. The it doesn't thing fix that your you problem. wanted. Yeah. Not only does it not fix your problem, but it's like a whole new hell that you're introduced to. Exactly. And then it, life becomes suddenly unbearable because you were so fixated on that one thing that you failed to understand that it's not that one thing that you need. Right. And so what I think is the theme of this, or that kind of the... Because, um, you know, every protagonist has a, has a choice to make. Right. And he chose to abandon this kind of idyllic world mm -hmm. where he would have to accept his deafness, mm -hmm. and he couldn't do it. Right. Because he still, again, is living the old way in order to fix his relationship, in order to fix that idea of family that he had mm -hmm. before. So the way I'm thinking of the end, the final scene of the movie, is him saying, I need to go back where I belong. Yeah, that's how I took it too. Okay, yeah. so we oh. saw it in a similar yeah. way. But for me, it was kind of this religious thing. It was okay. this religious moment right. that he came to. But that's also his only option at this point. Yeah, but he has to make it. Right, and totally. he hadn't done that before. Yeah, he didn't make the leap. So there's right. this, you know, also Kierkegaardian idea of taking. I the knew leap. you were gonna bring up Kierkegaard yeah. at some point. Well, it, yeah, it usually happens, or or Nietzsche. We'll we'll probably do Nietzsche. No, but this point. is more Kierkegaardian. It is Kierkegaard yeah. because he has to take the leap of faith, and he can't right. do it. Right. Right. He has. He's always being drawn back into mm -hmm. the. For Kierkegaard, it's the world of the aesthete, the and, the that kind of thing. Right, and I, I totally understand, and I think that's completely natural because if the leap of faith were that easy everybody would fucking that's make precisely it. Yeah. the point so so this is the for kierkegaard's journey you have to walk the journey alone and he mm -hmm. does that at the end of the movie he gives up the aesthetic pleasure of life mm -hmm. and and the for kierkegaard you even have to give up the ethical in life yeah yeah um in order to walk the path mm -hmm. of faith yeah and so finally he the decision he makes and right. then i knew you know, he found his moment of peace, and then it goes black. And I knew that was that was coming. Yeah, I thought that was that was very clearly communicated to me as well. This is a this strikes me as a very strong protagonist. Like he's not like he's a hero. You know, like he's not just some ordinary schmuck. I don't know. Well, except that he the hero usually is saving somebody else, right? And he doesn't do that, right? Yeah, but it wasn't some average person, right? Like, I, I didn't feel, I felt like he was a fast learner. He had a lot of strength. Yeah, he had a lot of conviction. And discipline. And discipline. Yeah. In the very beginning, you you see him making a smoothie with like turmeric powder and like, right. you know, very healthy. And whatever. It was like very healthy. And he makes breakfast for his girlfriend, Lou. And he does squats and like push ups every morning. And he's, he's like me. Yeah, he's totally like you. It's very, it's, it's very disciplined, right? And I think that a lot of people don't understand that musicians are not just like born cool. Oh, that's a great point. With tattoos and like abs, you know, especially like, you know, the musicians that they think are really hot or whatever. And they expect them to be just naturally cool. Like, okay, so I know a lot of girls who are not musicians who date musicians and they get very disappointed at the lifestyle that they have to put up with <laughs> because they see somebody who's just like having a good time on stage. Totally. Yeah, has tattoos and like, you know, nice bracelets or jewelry or whatever. And then you get into a relationship with a fucking drummer and he's making smoothies and oatmeal, you know, every morning and he's doing his exercises and, you know, he has to meditate with his ambient music fucking shit. <laughs> Okay, we're digging into personal life. Now. Yeah, and but that's the thing. That is the a lot of musicians, the one the real pros, people who really work at their craft, it's not a hobby like that. It's a lifestyle and it's also a fucking religion to right. to a lot of you guys, myself included. No, that's great. Yeah. So that touches into that aspect as well. He's very right. disciplined in his old life. Yes. Like the life that he can't let go. He's mm -hmm. ma he's achieved mastery. Mm -hmm. Like he's not a um ascetic, but he's a, he's like achieved mastery over his world. Mm -hmm. 
I didn't even think of that. That's, that's well, I, the whole time I was thinking, of course, he's not going to give this up right, that right, easily. Right. Because this was his entire existence. And, you know, at one point during his freak out, he was saying, just give me a gun so I could put it. In okay. The, so I, yeah, I, I felt I didn't go that far, right. but I felt that feeling. Yeah. 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 And I, that's why, I, yeah, I totally believe you. And I, a lot of musicians I know are like this dancers too, you know, it's very different for a musician to go deaf. Yes. And I thought the whole time that it was very unfair, almost, of the guy at the Vietnam War who lost his hearing to expect Ruben to accept his deafness oh, that's so good. easily. That's a good point. Yeah, so the so a musician's life, totally everything mm. you've, been, you've been saying, like all of those tattoos, all of those scars, it looks like he's got a, like someone put a, a cigar out on his yeah, chest. Yeah, I don't yeah, know if you yeah, noticed that, probably, but all of these yeah. details, it's inscribed in the body in a lot of mm -hmm, ways yeah. the things that artists sometimes have to go through in order to have the suffering to to then draw out the art that they right, do right. and for him i totally agree with you he's gotten past that shit mm -hmm. and he's gotten to the point where he is the master of mm -hmm. his world mm -hmm. and you're right they're right at the cusp mm -hmm. of i don't know if there's a fuck you everybody or if there's just a i've achieved what I what I fought to get to, we don't know. One thing I really want to point out is that all those indie musicians that you think that you're the only person who follows, they are, to me and to a lot of musicians, considered insanely successful. It takes so much to even get there. Right. Forget about being Beyonce. It takes so much to be that, like, you know, you pack up like a 200 seat whatever and you're touring like in these villages in Europe and you're making like a modest salary of let's say like 30 to 40 thousand dollars a year just from touring and sure. selling your music that is insanely successful right that's true right to get to that you have to really live that life and to give that up right when you're at the cusp of it that's why I was like this isn't some stupid dude who made bad choices for his health it is somebody who is faced a crisis yes it's a life or death situation for him totally and that's one of the things i was thinking early on is there's nothing else this guy can do yeah and musicians a lot of musicians are like this a lot of people like his age i'm thinking he's probably in his maybe his early 30s this protagonist looks like he's in the his character early. yeah the character maybe late 20s but like, i would say maybe i would say yeah like 32 early, or something. yeah early 30s at that age and you're a drummer and because you're, you're right you're right at the moment where if this doesn't happen now yeah what the fuck am i what the do? fuck yeah, am i gonna yeah, do yeah. yeah that i've been there so this brings it back to yeah. the difference between him and lou and why i question my own mm -hmm. empathy with her mm -hmm. i'm not saying she was a poser right i don't think she was i right. think she was genuinely rebelling with her own demons that she had mm -hmm because of what happened with her mother and her father. Right. And that's why they have this family together mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that the two of them have. Mm -hmm. But then we see her having this other... Again, it's the idea of hell and paradise, mm -hmm. right? He can't live in her paradise. She can live in paradise. Mm -hmm. That's why it's still his story, right? Totally. He has to leave yeah. paradise because he doesn't belong there. Right. And I think that because this character is so strong... And such a hero to me, he was able to figure that out relatively very quick. I think he came to a lot of his decisions and the right decisions. He came to the stillness relatively quick. I wouldn't have been able to do that in yeah, such a short time. Like in this movie, the idea of time passing was was kind of interesting um, because you couldn't really tell how much time was passing. Right. They didn't really give you any indication. But me judging from the fact that they didn't have white hair and you know, yeah, you know, true. Well, yeah. you know what I was watching though. <laughs> Just from a hair and makeup kind uh -huh. of uh, geek moment, I was watching to see how much his natural hair was going to overgrow the bleach uh, yeah, that he yeah, had, yeah. and I was thinking about this mm -hmm. early on. That was going to be my indication of time passing. Right. They did it a little bit. A little bit, and then he like... And then he shaved yeah, his head, yeah. yeah. So, I, to me, he comes to the decision only at the very end. Right. But then, yeah, there is this question of how much time is passing. That I think that's sort of the arc, is, is he fucked up the first decision. Mm -hmm. But maybe he had to do that. Maybe he had to fuck up that decision. That. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. He had to fuck up that decision in order to make the decision later. 
So again, there's, I think, this Kierkegaardian element of he can't live in pleasure, but mm-hmm. he can remove himself from hell in order to reach the transcendent mm-hmm. moment mm-hmm. where he can realize who he is now. Mm-hmm. And, and again, that idea of acceptance that we talked about. What would be the alternative of like not accepting? You know what I mean? Like, I think that would be a, a horrific descent into drug abuse. Right. I think he would try to hang on with her. Yeah, definitely. And, and yeah. she would reject him, mm-hmm. and he would go into the streets, and mm-hmm. he would... Uh, and we don't really know. Maybe he does choose this, but right. I don't think so. I think the I look think in so. his eye yeah. makes him realize. But he could. He would go back on heroin, I think. I'll just... Okay, I'll fucking say it. He takes off the shit. He takes mm-hmm. off the technology right. that enables him to hear in this hellish manner well, in order to achieve this moment of total peace. Mm-hmm. Um, so he can't go. I don't think at, at that point, I don't think he can. No, he can't. But in the moment before he takes that off, if that church bell doesn't ring in that mm-hmm. moment, maybe mm-hmm. he goes on a slide into heroin addiction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then he also breaks up with Lou before he leaves. The right. House. So maybe that's the moment of clarity. Yeah. Like he sees her and she performed that scene so well, right. whoever that actress is. Mm-hmm. Like I wasn't sure about her acting in the early part of the film, mm-hmm. but I thought her transformation yeah. was fantastic. Yeah, it was. Maybe she just didn't do the punk <laughs> as mm-hmm. well as I would have liked. But her her look, you know, it's kind of, the, you know, when you, when you're, you furrow your brow, mm-hmm. when it's like, yeah, you're saying yes, mm-hmm. but you're like, your face is saying no. <laughs> yep, yeah. And he sees it. Mm-hmm. And I think it's possible because he already kind of knows. Well, okay, so that's mm-hmm. so that's the interesting thing. That's the kind of psychological aspect mm-hmm. as well. Is within him he he knows this probably at some point in his unconscious. Maybe it's the moment he tells the old man that he had the surgery, but from that point on he's got to know mm-hmm. that he can't. Well, he's already reached a certain level of resignation like serenity, mm-hmm. you know, when he gets to Paris or whatever, Nuit sur Seine or whatever, because you can see it in his face. We talk about the frenzied look in his eye when he... Right. But I still think to. he's desperate to get that life back. But on At an unconscious, point, I think, on a conscious level, but yeah. on an unconscious level, I think there's something that needs to emerge, yes. and it's the conversation. There. But you know, when you know something, you want something, but at the same time, you want to find out soon that you can't have it, you know what I mean? Like you still oh, want it, I see what you're saying. but you just want to get it over with and know. And that's to me, he looked like somebody who knew already, but he just had to find out. And so that's why it was easier. It was a smooth process of acceptance right. because he had already done some of the acceptance before he got there. He just needed a real answer. He just needed the definitive sign or whatever. Right. Totally. Um, and I totally relate to that. And it's a relief. It is liberating to know that when you are rid of options, when you know. And that's why I said it was tragic. About, you know, youth is very tragic because of the uncertainty and the potential and the options. Sometimes options are not good. Right. Mm-hmm. I, I wonder if someone, again, the way that an, an artist like him has gone through life. And, you know, there's the artists who go through hell. Mm-hmm. And out of that suffering comes their art. Then there's the people who don't go through as much hell, and out of that comes art. There's, mm-hmm. I'm not trying to make a validity right, of right. one or the yeah. other, but his experience, I think, he's a very stubborn person, mm-hmm. but I think if he didn't have those hard experiences, I don't know that he could come to that decision. Adversity makes, it, it speeds up the greatness. Now you sound like fucking Nietzsche. Okay, I don't know what Nietzsche said about <laughs> adversity, but all I know is that when I was studying jazz improv, I had you know a few lessons with um, Hal Crook, who's a famous. I think jazz I, I've even heard that name. Yeah, he is a primarily a trombonist, but he you know plays a lot of instruments, and he is a very famous jazz educator based in Rhode Island. Okay, and a professor at Berkeley. The first thing he says to you, you got to put limitations when you're you know practicing so basically you have to limit yourself and you have to take away things and work those muscles out so basically you have to learn how to improvise over five notes first three notes two notes you know you have to be able to make those three notes sound interesting Mm. That right and just that idea of limitations is finding how much you're capable of doing within that limitation yeah and that's the first thing you got to do Interesting ideas, improv, you know, in improv, 
they come from limiting yourself. Totally. Yeah. Not only in improv, but mm-hmm. I tell, like, I tell my students, you have to place limits on yourself. Mm-hmm. What I do, like, when I teach video production, you know, filmmaking, or if I'm teaching script writing, I have these rules. You can't use cell phones and you can't use computers. Mm -hmm. They have a really hard time dealing with that limitation. Mm -hmm. But it's basically, I have to force them out of Mm -hmm. their comfortable world because you can't have conflict over a cell phone. Totally. You just can't do it. And so they have the characters have to face each other. Yeah. So yeah, all of art needs this this limitation. Yeah. Or else you're just going to be writing or playing some boring ass fucking shit that nobody wants to hear because right. it's boring. And right. it's the same fucking shit. Right. That's Al Crook. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah. But th- going back to Lou and adversity, she has that moment when she's singing her dad's song. Um, and she kind of looks at him and, you know, she's not happy about singing this song, right? And then he was like, later in bed, he says, wow, look at you. Like, you know, you were, you're singing and you, you look different and you speak French and whatever. And then she's kind of sheepish and she says, well, that's, you know, my dad stuff and whatever. I guarantee you she's going to quit, quit music. Oh, really? Yeah. I guarantee you, because there's no reason for her to pursue music at this point on. That's a good point. Yeah, so music in some ways is a need. It, it, you have to do it, um, and and he, she doesn't have to do right, it. Right, and he was her sort of escape. You know, there's a there's a whole other film in this film from her point of view, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and there's a whole other thread. Yeah. Which totally. would be, I, I love this idea. Like she's, you know, sort of the, yeah, she's the other, what they call line of action. So mm-hmm. she's the other line of action. And we don't really get her line of action. Mm-hmm. I always am fascinated by if we flipped the mm-hmm. A plot and the B plot, what the film would be. Again, if the movie were to be told through her point of view, mm-hmm. we would know what she goes through. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, he comes back, which is reversed in this movie. Mm-hmm. But then the scene, if if that was the case, then the scene with her singing the song, we're feeling the movie through her, right. and she looks at him, and it's like he's not he's not going to like this. Yeah, yeah. He, she knows that it's fucking. Yeah, lame. that's why she's yeah. so sheepish in singing yeah. the song. Yeah. And then when she later does the harmony, I think in the second go round, I don't know if there's a first chorus, you can hear the quality of her voice is yeah, yeah. much better. Yeah, but she, her heart is not in it. Anymore. Her heart is still yeah. not in it. Yeah. It, it picks up a little bit. Yeah. But, but she, it's like a duty thing. She basically did true. this. Everything that she's doing now is to appease her father so that she could, I don't know, like live there. Whatever. This is why I don't know if I like her character. Mm-hmm. I think she's very sympathetic. I don't really know if I like her necessarily, yeah. but I can I, understand. I can understand her and yeah. I could want to tell her that she's making a mistake. <laughs> Right. So I, th- I, feel I, I didn't her. think about that, but I think you're yeah. right. I think I think she would probably not do it. But this is the only way she can save him, and that's why she's doing this. Because I Maybe don't. Maybe she doubt. realizes that in the midst of singing the song. No, I don't think so. I think she knows from the beginning. This is her way of saving him. This is the only way that she can save him, and she loves him. But she didn't plan that song at all. No, 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 no. Yeah, that's. The, yeah, I like that. But she loves him. That's the one yeah. thing that she knows. Right. She doesn't know fuck else. Right. Yeah. She knows that she loves him and that she wants to save him, that he needs to be saved. But right. she doesn't know about anything else. She doesn't know if she wants to sing. She doesn't know if she likes her dan. You know, like, right. I'm sorry, I'm dimin- you know, I'm undermining this character. But it's because I know, I think I understand her. That's what I like. It's a complex character. You're not Very quite complex. sure how you feel yeah. about her. Yeah. Cece, why don't we take another break yeah, and then okay. we'll kind of wrap things up. Okay. Movies about music. I wanted to sort of close things out by just mm-hmm. talking specifically about the music and the and the representation mm. or the or the way that music mm. um, happened in the film. I think it's safe to say it's neither of our taste right. in music, even though you and I have quite different tastes in music, mm-hmm. but I think for both of us, it's just not our taste in music. First mm-hmm. of all, I do not like this trend that started happening around, I don't know, 99 mm-hmm. of having no bass player in the band. Oh, yeah. I yeah. cannot fucking do Me it. Neither. I yeah. never liked the white stripes or the black mm-hmm. keys. Mm-hmm. I could never do any of those bands. Mm-hmm. So it's one of those duo bands, and it works for the narrative. It's just the two of them, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But I wanted to ask you, what did you think of, first of all, the music, and then also the way that the music was produced in the, in the film? Yeah. I don't know if they meant to make it sound like that like you know how are we supposed to you know was it done somewhat ironically like i don't know because the first opening song that they were doing we see them you know in a concert right and like the, the one of those basement 
looking. It was very smells like Teen Spirit. Very, uh, very room, and then yeah. it was like kind of a room, and you've got the audience all around. Right. The band. And she had a horrible voice. I'm sorry. Like, you know, and it, towards the end, we find out that she could actually sing. I yeah. think that was another thing that mm-hmm. was kind of like, yeah, we find out that she really can sing. Yeah. But for this, whatever she was doing, I couldn't stand it. It was the kind of thing where, okay, if I need to, I couldn't sit through a gig like that. No, me either. And yeah. you, the movie starts this way. That's, yeah. the, the movie starts with a long take mm-hmm. on him, mm-hmm. and he's just sitting there waiting for his cue to come in. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he's got his owl eyes, his <laughs> cocaine eyes, <laughs> even though he's not doing cocaine. Uh-huh. And then, yeah, it kicks into the music. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know how authentic you know that music was portrayed, because I don't listen to this kind of music, and I don't seek out these gigs. But well, all I can say is it fucking sounded like one of those gigs. Like, you know, I've, I would go to horrible venues, music venues. Why is it that music venues, speci- venues specifically designed for music, live music, have the worst sound systems? Like, I don't get it. I've, I've played so many gigs where I could not hear myself whatsoever. And all I could hear is like some distorted drum and bass thing with a delay. And then like everybody's mic is picking up the drums. That's what it sounded like. Okay. So I've got it. I've got a take on this. Okay. So one of the things that really annoys me, I this movie was nominated for some Oscar awards. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think that he won for best actor, but I think he was nominated. I'm mm-hmm. not sure if it was nominated for best sound. It should have been nominated for best mm-hmm. sound. Yeah, totally. But what the fucking Academy mm-hmm. <laughs> cannot figure out, they cannot figure out how to reward what is good sound because what they do is they listen to songs. So you right. take a movie like Rocket Man or Bohemian Rhapsody, oh. which are both movies I had problems with, and it sounds great. And what they do is, oh, here's a cut to Roger Taylor kick mm-hmm. drum let's bring up the kick drum channel a little bit mm-hmm. you know it's just completely spectacle mm-hmm. ear candy kind of stuff mm-hmm. we were both annoyed by the music at the beginning of the music mm-hmm. and i think this is intentional because what i kind of came around to is oh this is how he hears it oh, it was very yeah, drum yeah. again point of audition as they call it or subjective sound. that makes all the sense in the world yeah yeah so i think that the the timbre of the music yeah. was very specific to be his perspective and i thought that was great because usually films are not brave enough to do that kind of thing well then in that case it was brilliant because i almost yeah. felt like a it fucking drummer i almost felt like a drummer so you got to enter the seat you got to sit on the on the, yeah, on the yeah. throne this is kind of what we hear we're just oh i'm so sorry you guys <laughs> yeah 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 we usually have bad monitors yeah. you know and we kind of, you know, we're, a lot of times as a drummer, you're you're kind of feeling things out. Mm-hmm. Like, and this is the other reason why I hate not having a bass player. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm sorry to the guitar players and the keyboard players, but I tune in on what the singer's doing first, and then I really tune into what the bass player's doing because mm-hmm. I have to. I'm totally tuning into what the bass player's doing. Okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah because it's the root. It's the yeah. uh, it's the yeah. it's the bass. Because guitar players will play like the most fucked up voicings at any opportune right. time, and so I need to listen to But the they're f- kind of playing. To me to me a, a guitar player is kind of playing. But then I'll take like someone like our mutual friend Gino Brand. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love playing with Gino because yeah. um because of what he does melodically, yeah. it's almost like I can anticipate where he's going. Yeah, me too. But I, yeah. at the same time, I don't key into what he's doing in uh-huh. terms of the dynamics and things like that. Right, right. So you get into these live situations, and if I can't hear the singer, mm-hmm. and if I can't hear the bass player, mm-hmm. I'm lost. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so he's like, he's watching her, he's listening to her, and then later he says, like, even after he loses his hearing, he's like, I got this, you know? And I know that he... Right. Yeah, and that's very interesting to me because, like, what goes through a drummer's mind? Is it, I have to keep time, man, like... Let me see if I can do this. I've never been asked that question. I'm going to try to answer Mm -hmm. it right now, and I've never answered Mm -hmm. it. But what's going through a drummer's mind is... Number one, Mm -hmm. don't fuck anything up. Yeah, you guys. Yeah, I imagine. Yeah, hit your hit your cues. Uh But then number two, meter, Mm -hmm. which is different from tempo. You have to maintain the tempo. Getting the right tempo, maintaining the right meter. Don't fuck up the song. Mm -hmm. And then, if you have those things already working for you, Mm -hmm. then you can let that go. Okay. And, And then you can really listen. 
mm-hmm. uh, and you can have the confidence to then tune into the singer, tune into the bass player, tune into the guitar player. Cool. And that's when music becomes really fun and you can experiment more so when true. you've got that autopilot. Mm-hmm. So it's not fucking up tempo meter also volume level because drummers Mm -hmm. if they care Mm -hmm. really really know that they are abusing the ears of the players around them i think good drummers know this like we really have to control our volume unless you're on a big stage and that's fun you can just let go the thing is the louder the drums are the better they sound Mm -hmm. that's actually true when you're playing drums really quietly that instrument doesn't sing it it needs to have that resonance come out of it so you kind of have to hit it hard Mm -hmm. these again these these four things i think are Mm -hmm. kind of going into the autopilot thing once you can let those things go and that comes with experience and confidence Mm -hmm. Then you can then you can really listen to the people mm-hmm. around you and really float and then you can really fly and you can take some chances. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of what's going through my okay. mind. And really just enjoying it. Enjoying enjoying yeah. the hell out of it. What about singers? What's going through the singer's mind when you're performing? Like I'm just if I don't know the song, if it's not integrated enough, I'm just trying not to fuck up. It's the same thing. Um, like, you know, I'm I'm frequently counting at the same time when I'm first, you know, when we first start rehearsing um especially when i have to get back in after like a guitar solo or something right but you're very good at this well i was trained in jazz right and you're really why, good yeah. with solos you and you know form really well right but that that's everything that a singer has to do in like a jazz that's every and in jazz like you know they switch up like dr- after drum solos oh my god that that is a great way to get lost for those of you who have not seen cc sing <laughs> She not only knows the form, but she's so fucking cool at knowing the form. Like, like when you give a solo and you kind of do this thing, mm-hmm. and then you kind of bring the mic. Oh yeah, you're yeah. You're, you're like Trey cool. No, but then like I I suck at this, you know. No, you don't. In a jazz context. No, you don't. That's what I'm. I saying. mean, like I I've been through those situations where i'm the only idiot in the band because like you know the singer is frequently the idiot and i learned the hard way like you know in in boston but if if you don't come in Mm -hmm. you have to come in if you don't come in with the gesture then the soloist is but i do i keep going yeah but i think that's the bare minimum that a singer needs to know in order to be a singer but i still think it's a very important all i'm saying is you're very good at it and you're very cool at doing it thank you because that's the other crucial element when you're a performer you can't be like you know, exactly moving your head around or like tapping on top of your head or something i like guess that. what i'm trying to say is that i worked really hard on it yeah yeah this shows. is 10 plus years of being right. in bands this is the thing so yeah. the more you experience and and with drumming those four elements right. of tempo meter volume and not fucking up if mm-hmm. you can let those four things go exactly then you can yeah. play so once i stop counting right then i could really sing but that depends on the other players too to another form but usually by the time i stop counting they all have it like have it have it right 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 yeah but usually i'm listening to the bass player mm, yeah i think it's because i started doing bass duos mm-hmm. when i was in school mm-hmm. you really need to pull that note out of your ass well it's a good person to follow because mm-hmm. and you just hope that they're doing mm-hmm. it right too yeah it's kind of like if if everything if something feels like it's going wrong mm-hmm. follow either the bass player or the drummer right because the the drummer is going to be the engine and the bass player is going to be the architect mm-hmm. maybe of the form because right. that's the that's the bass yeah. player's fucking job right yeah totally yeah i yeah. do that i'm listening to everybody that's the other thing is you kind of have to you have to do a lot of things at once mm-hmm. all right any last thoughts about the film it was kind of a heavy one for our first podcast of movies about music <laughs> yes it was very heavy but it was very I don't want to say satisfying in the end, but the ending was something that I could totally accept. Yeah, I thought it was quite beautiful. And I, yes, it was very this, beautiful. Yeah. I th- for me, this religious spiritual moment, I thought, because how are you going to end this film? And they just did it to me perfectly. Yeah, I, I feel that, the that same. That tied way. in yeah. everything that Yeah, came. and in that sense, it was very believable. Everything was very believable. Everything was, yeah. 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 And that's all I ask for true. in a movie. Yeah. True, me too. Performances were all great. Mm-hmm. Did you know that Riz Ahmed is a musician? I didn't know that because, so, so this is always a thing too. Okay, this is one other thing I wanted to add is movies about music mm-hmm. or movies with performance in them right. always get the drums wrong. Totally. Yeah. So you'll see somebody hit a crash cymbal <laughs> yeah. and there's no sound yeah. or you'll hear a crash cymbal and mm-hmm. he didn't do that. Mm-hmm. And sometimes 
the bead is flipped upside down mm-hmm. in, in the camera and nobody fucking right. notices. Yeah. They handled, I swear, there's something called, do you know what Foley is? No. Foley is recording all of the sound effects that were not properly captured on set. Mm. So someone watches the movie and they perform these, there's these artists oh, and they wow. have all these clothes and oh, objects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they yeah, do, I know you've seen is. videos yeah, yeah. of that. I think what they did is they had a, a drummer doing Foley to what the actor was doing. Oh, that's insane. Yeah. I don't know this, right. but um, I, I feel like they had a drummer mm-hmm. doing Foley to his performance. Okay. That makes sense. Do we have a movie we're going to do next, or we do, do we not know yet? Um, I don't think we know yet. I don't think we know yet either. Mm-hmm. All right. Peace out, everyone. Bye-bye. Under the moonlight, I'll sing you a song So you'd magically feel a love that's alone Hopefully they'll live eternally If we paint ourselves Bright with stories of heroes and poets and sadness and war, of immeasurable pain, unconditional love, movies about music.